Now let's do a more in-depth analysis. We'll look at the molecule acetone, which has the condensed structure CH3, C parentheses O, CH3. The parentheses around the O mean it is a side chain and not a bridging group. So the Lewis structure for acetone looks like this. So here are my two terminal CH3 groups, and there's my O side chain. And then to have the oxygen be neutral, it has to have two lone pairs and two bonds. So let's look at steric numbers. The carbon on the left has one, two, three, four electron groups, so its steric number equals four. That means it is tetrahedral. Same is true for the carbon on the right. Now let's look at the central carbon. It's got three electron groups steric number of three. None of them are lone pairs, so it's trigonal planar. Hence, a structurally better way to draw this molecule might be as follows. There's your CH3 group on the left. Here's your CH3 group on the right. And your carbonyl carbon. So we say that acetone is a trigonal planar molecule because that's the molecular shape around the interesting part where there's a hetero atom. The electronegativity of a carbon atom is 2.5. The electronegativity of oxygen is 3.5. That means this bond is very polar. The pair of bonding electrons is localized in space much closer to the oxygen atom than the carbon atom giving the oxygen a partial negative charge, which we denote with a delta minus, and the carbon a partial positive charge, denoted by a delta plus. And we denote the bond dipole like this, pointing toward the more electronegative atom. So we say this is a polar molecule. Now let's use valence bond theory to examine the electronic structure at each of these atoms. One idea of valence bond theory is that a bond forms between two adjacent atoms when they each have a half-filled orbital that can overlap. Sigma bonds generally form from hybrid orbitals, and pi bonds form from side-on overlap of p orbitals. So say we have a carbon sp3 orbital with a single electron in it, and a hydrogen 1s orbital with a single electron in it. And we bring those two together, they overlap. Now we have a bond, and this is a sigma bond, and it's from sp3 to s. There's your carbon nucleus, and there is your hydrogen nucleus. Now it's sigma because the electron density is along the bond axis, the bond axis being an imaginary line drawn between the two nuclei. If we have a carbon p orbital with one electron in it and an oxygen p orbital with one electron in it, we bring those two together. Here is your carbon nucleus, and here is your oxygen nucleus, and here is one lobe of electron density, and here is the other lobe of electron density, shaded because it's in opposite phase. Now phase is just a property of waves. Say you have a sine wave that has negative amplitude 
to the left of the origin and positive amplitude to the right. Let's call that negative shaded. Then what we do is we rotate it 360 degrees around that axis and we see the solid orbital, the 3D. And we shade the left side because it's in negative phase. So what we've got here is a pi orbital. Pi orbitals are always formed from a p overlapping with a p, and they have two lobes of electron density, and it's pi because the electron density is outside the bond axis. Right, we've got the lobe above and the lobe below, but on the bond axis is a node. A quick word about the type of bond versus its composition. A single bond is usually sigma. A double bond has one sigma bond and one pi bond. A triple bond is one sigma bond and two pi bonds. That means as far as your hybridization goes, the sigma bond is formed from hybrid orbitals, usually. The pi bond is always formed from unhybridized p orbitals. So, to have a double bond, the atoms involved have to have one unhybridized p orbital. To have a triple bond, the atoms involved have to have two unhybridized p orbitals. So let's look at the different kinds of hybridization associated with these bonds. So let's look at the hybridization on each of the atoms in acetone. Of course, the hydrogens don't need to hybridize. Terminal atoms often don't, but central atoms usually will, as does the oxygen. So first let's look at the terminal carbons. And these are identical. They both have four single bonds. Now the electron configuration of carbon is 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. The 2s and 2p electrons are the valence electrons. Here's your 2s orbital with its two electrons and your three 2p orbitals with two electrons added according to Hund's rule. According to valence bond theory, carbon should only be able to make two bonds because we have only two unpaired electrons. How does carbon make four bonds? The answer is it hybridizes, and if we want to make four si single bonds, we need four hybrid orbitals. So if we hybridize the s orbital and the 3p orbitals, that's four orbitals that we started with, we're going to get four hybrid orbitals. They will all have the same energy, which is the average of the s and the p's, and we're going to call them sp3 hybrids because each one is composed of one quarter s character and three quarters p character. And now if we put in our electrons, we had three spin up and one spin down. Something like that. Now, each of these hydrogens has a single unpaired 1s electron, which can form a sigma bond, just as shown here. And then this carbon must have two unpaired electrons, or three unpaired electrons, in uh, sigma orbitals, that is hybrid orbitals. We'll get to that in a minute. Bottom line here is we are capable of making four single bonds, which is four sigma bonds. Now, since we hybridized four orbitals and we got four hybrid orbitals, that just illustrates that the number of orbitals you start with equals the number of orbitals you end up with. Now let's look at the central carbon. So it's got a double bond, which is sigma and a pi, and then two sigma bonds, or two single bonds, which are both sigma. So what do we need? We need three hybrids, and we need one unhybridized p orbital. So again, we're starting from the same atomic orbital basis set. 
with three elect or sorry two electrons in 2s and two electrons in 2p like so now we're not going to hybridize all of them we're just going to hybridize the s and two of the p orbitals so we end up with three hybrid orbitals calling them sp2 and one unhybridized p orbital and we put in our electrons preserving the spin. Now we're capable of making three sigma bonds from the three sp2 hybrid orbitals and we're capable of making one pi orbital or one pi bond from the p orbital. And that's exactly what the carbon has. Now let's look at oxygen. The oxygen has a double bond, which is a sigma and a pi, and then it's got two lone pairs. Lone pairs go in sigma orbitals. So we need three sigma orbitals, or three hybrid orbitals, to make the sigmas, the bond in the two lone pairs, and we need one unhybridized p orbital. And that'll give us the pi bond. Now this is a little bit different from carbon because we've got a different electron configuration. 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. Carbon had 2p2. So same orbitals with different occupancies. Here's our 2s and our 2p orbitals. 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, so we need three hybrids, which means we're going to hybridize the S and two of the P's to get three SP2 hybrid orbitals. And we leave one of the P's alone. And now we put in our electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So. These doubly occupied hybrid orbitals are our lone pairs. Amazing, right? This singly occupied hybrid orbital is our sigma bond. And the singly occupied p orbital gives us our pi bond.